Hi, Chris Glynn here with the Nightlight Podcast. Simon Bennett is my guest once again on the show today. Nice to have you back, Simon. Very nice to be back, uh, Chris. Last time you were with us, Simon, we talked about the mysteries of the six seals of the scroll in Revelation chapter six. Before we talk about what happens next, maybe you could quickly review the meaning of the six seals. Yeah, we read the six seals and we came to the conclusion that from some rather multiple bits of evidence that the white horse that is conquering and continuing to conquer is is Christ. That's right. The second horse was uh, the red horse war. And we kind of uh, concluded that war has been active for the last 2000 years. It's just been a feature. Right. That in, in Daniel 9, actually, it says that wars will continue to the end. Yes. And so we felt, therefore, that these horses riding are not sort of events that are going to happen now, they're actually the, the prime actors on the stage of the last days for the 2000, last 2,000 years, and that these riders are just going to ride in increasing power in the last days, Christ included. The gospel is going to go forth all the way till his return. Amen. And war is obviously going to continue. There's going to be some, some, some devastating sort of wars and attacks. We read of them in Revelations. The black horse, which represents business, is also going to become increasingly powerful and dominant. It is already. And the last horse, death, unfortunately, appears to be very active during the last day's period before Jesus returns. And the saints will be persecuted, which is the fifth seal. They've been persecuted since the first century. Since Revelation was given, they've been persecuted throughout the last 2,000 years, and there's going to be a great persecution of the saints before Jesus returns. But the sixth seal represents this huge shift. It's the day of the Lord. And we read it last time. It's initiated by this well-known term, the sun turned black, the whole moon turned red, the stars fell in the sky, fell to earth as late figs from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. And this little phrase about that is it's spoken of throughout the Old Testament as representing the sign of the day of the Lord. Right. And so we're going to be exploring that today, the day of the Lord in all its aspects. I think it's just a very exciting subject and passage. Absolutely. Largely because uh, I think we realize once we study it, that the return of Jesus is not quite the end of the story. Uh, from some last days passages, especially in Daniel, it seems to be the end of the story. The, it's the last thing that Daniel covers. But here in Revelation, we see that the story continues and there's a, a lot of action that happens in the day of the Lord that we should be aware of so that we discern prophecy carefully. Nightlight, keeping you in tune with the times. So we're going to start with the sixth seal, which is the day of the Lord, the sun turning black. And that's what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He said that immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be turned black, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven. So this is an event that happens after the tribulation. It's the first thing to note. Jesus described it as happening immediately after the tribulation. That's right. This great shaking of the heavens when there's no light. I wonder if you could just read that six seal, Chris, and just refresh the listeners with it. Sure. This is Revelation 6, 12 through 17 from the King James Version. And I beheld when he'd opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So the first thing to, to know is that Jesus said that that sign of the sun turning black was the sign of his return and of his gathering his elect, sending out his angels to gather his elect 
the rapture will happen at this time and we will go up. Jesus describes that in Matthew 24. But for the people on earth, this is quite conclusively, the day of their wrath has come. And so this is the great turnaround. The wrath of the Lord is now going to be poured out on all those who remain on the earth once all his children have been raptured out of the earth. That's right. And this is probably just even this verse is just so key because many people believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. It's sad. And the reason they believe in the pre-tribulation rapture is they've been taught that the tribulation is a time of the wrath of God. Um, but this verse seems to clearly indicate that the day of his wrath comes after the tribulation. Absolutely. It's a really important distinction in these days when there is so much pre-trib rapture teaching. It appears that the tribulation is not the wrath of God. Actually, we are more warned about the wrath of the Antichrist. In Revelations 12, 12, we read, Rejoice, you heavens and you that dwell in them, but woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. So Revelations 12 warns the inhabitants of the earth that the tribulation period is a time of Satan's wrath. And that here in the sixth seal, we read that the day of the Lord's wrath comes immediately after the tribulation, once the church has been raptured out. That's right. And so then we want to look in tribulation, where is this uh, wrath described? And it's, I think, a very rarely read passage in the scripture. So I just thought we'd just read through it because uh, there's nothing better than just reading the scripture. It's Revelation 16. We're going to read about the pouring out of the bowls of wrath of God on the earth. Wow. Here we go. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Yes, so there we go. That's a lovely connection. We see that this is the wrath that is poured out on the Antichrist's kingdom, on those who have received the mark of the beast. Interestingly enough, my wife read an article, I think it was about the person who invented the RFID chip. And he said that there is a side effect of getting the chip. Really? And that is that sores would eventually start coming out on your body. Just an interesting insert there. Yeah, that's interesting. But clearly this is happening at Jesus's return onto those people who have received the mark of the beast. You can go on, Chris. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. 
and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. Wow, wonderful. So therefore we just see this uh, chapter go through as the, the vials or bowls of wrath are poured out on the earth. And the sixth one is the preparation for this great battle of that great day of God Almighty, the battle of Armageddon. And so we see that there's a uh, time, therefore, for the saints of God to be with Christ in heaven while the first bowls of wrath are poured out. And now we'll turn to Revelations 19, where we're going to read about the marriage supper of the Lamb, followed by the battle, what is commonly known as the Battle of Armageddon, this final great battle when Christ comes as an overcoming king. So I think if we could read from verse 6, we'll just read about the joyous marriage supper of the Lamb, where we will be at this time. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Yeah, so we've, this, is, this is where we will be. The, all the church of God, all those who know Christ, are going to be enjoying this wonderful marriage supper. It's that lovely verse in Luke. I think it's in Luke 21 where Jesus says, If you are watching, then I will gird myself, make you sit down at a table, and I will serve you. Just absolutely beautiful the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then once the marriage supper of the Lamb has concluded, then we are ready for the, the this great battle of Armageddon, which we read of in verses 11 to 21. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. 
and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So that's the heavenly view. Uh, maybe we can just jump to verse 19 where we're going to see what's happening on earth as Jesus comes down. Uh, verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gather together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Wow. So we've seen the train of events now, the, the, the sixth seal, the day of the Lord, the rapture, and the beginning of this, the day of his wrath, which concludes with this battle of Armageddon, or it's the sixth bowl that's poured out. This is the defeat, defeat of the Antichrist in Second Thessalonians, described as the man doomed to destruction, which is quite a nice, I think it's a nice way to describe him when we do talk about him, doomed to destruction. And we see the battle of Armageddon. This is where Jesus comes down to take over. And, and for most people, possibly, that is the end of the story. However, we're going to read on into uh, Revelations 20, and we're going to see that it's actually not the end of the story. Because though the beast has been thrown into the lake of burning fire, Satan is not, and Satan is actually preserved. And so we're going to read about that now, Chris. Can you read uh, Revelations 20, verses 1 to, 1 to 3? And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he lay hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So here we have the first mention, I think, of this a thousand year period. We're going to see it repeated uh, in the next few verses as well. There is going to be an era of a thousand years of Christ's rule. And during that period, as we read, Satan is thrown into the abyss, uh, somewhere other places called the bottomless pit. And he's locked up there, not allowed to deceive the nations until the end. But then he will be set free for a short time. So this is Satan's trajectory. He was in heaven. He's thrown down to earth. He ruled on earth for a bit as the Antichrist or through the Antichrist. And then he is now under the earth in the bottomless pit for this, the beginning of the millennium and through most of this a thousand year period. And now we're just going to read about this a thousand year period in the next few verses. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Hallelujah. This little passage just gives us so much information and it talks there will be two resurrections. The first resurrection is the rapture. Those are those who come to life and reign with Christ a thousand years. But verse 5 is interesting. The rest of the dead do not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So the resurrection of all the dead of all the ages 
which is going to be a resurrection to judgment because they weren't saved, is not going to happen at Christ's return, but it's going to happen at the end of the millennium. And we're going to read about it after we read about uh, from verse 11 to 15. We're going to read about this final resurrection. But the first resurrection is just for the saints. End time news and views. Simon, before we go on, maybe you could just clarify for any of our listeners who are not clear what the difference is between these two resurrections and two judgments. The judgment seat of Christ, which we just read about, and then the great white throne judgment that we'll read about at the end of this chapter. Absolutely. I mean, Paul says that we must we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the good we have done, receive rewards for the good we have done. And I guess to recognize the the good that we haven't done or the bad things that we've done. Right. So we are going to come before Christ. It's described beautifully in, in, in Daniel 12, where it says, describing this first resurrection. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So coming before Christ, the saved, there are going to be those who, you know, it's not going to be all, (laughs) I think it will be wonderful, but there will be Christians naturally, maybe they're Christians who persecuted their neighbors, (laughs) Um, as as looks like may well be possible during the last days. But that's the first resurrection, the resurrection of the saved. Those who know Christ are going to be resurrected to receive our rewards. Yes. I think there will also be shame in all of us, probably for our lacks and our short-sightedness in our lives of where we've gone astray and where we haven't sort of served him as we would have liked ourselves to do. For sure. But then this passage here clearly says that the rest of the dead do not come to life until the thousand years were ended. And so this second resurrection of all the unsaved happens at the end of the millennium, and that is when there is this great judgment of the unsaved. And we're going to read it. So we'll just hold off on discussing this judgment. It has some interesting things in it. Um, but if we could just maybe carry on on the passage for now, which is just reading about Satan's release from prison would be great. And then we'll get on to the, the, the resurrection and judgment of the dead. Lighting your path through the end times. You're with Nightlight. Just to be clear, Simon, during this 1,000 years, which is, I mean, a long time, the devil is bound and imprisoned in the bottomless pit. And the demons and fallen angels are not going to be around. So the only evil that is left upon the earth during the millennium is the evil that is still inherent in men's hearts. As the scripture says, the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? You're right. And actually, I just wanted to talk about that. I I realized that I was sort of going ahead of myself, talking about this reign of Christ for a thousand years. Perhaps we've been brought up to feel this is just going to be a time of, of great peace and tranquility and everything's going to, be, going to be wonderful and peaceful. But we do see that Christ's reign is defined as a rule with a rod of iron. I think you just read that in Revelation 19.15. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. And we read of it in Revelation 12.5. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And so we wonder, well, that doesn't sound like the Christ that we're used to. Uh, You know, the loving, graceful, peace-loving Christ. Because this rule is defined as a rod of iron, and we wonder, what does that mean with the rod of iron? And we remember that in Daniel 2, there was a kingdom that ruled strong as iron. That's right. And it was described like this. The fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. That's talking about the Roman Empire or this last empire. And that's confirmed in Revelations 2.27, where we read, He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. And so it's just interesting to realize that Christ is going to be, have to be very firm because he's coming back not to a, a heaven, a heavenly world, but to a really fallen world that we live in now. Absolutely. There's some people believe that Christ will kill everybody who received the mark of the beast when he returns. But in the battle of Armageddon, it seems to say he's going to kill, you know, he's going to defeat those armies and kill the soldiers. But otherwise, I think he's going to have to repair, come and try to repair, you know, what's left on the earth. And I think there are going to be 
you know, there's got to be people left on the earth to rule. All of the church is removed. And I think he's going to come back to this world, the one we're living in now with all of its fallen nature. And he's going to be restoring that. That's right. And he is going to uh, rule with a rod of iron. I mean, in Isaiah 2, it d- does describe it. Isaiah 2, 4, he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So it's his first thing is to put an end to war, destroy all the weapons of war, stop the arms industry. But he will rebuke many people. Because of this description of his rule with the rod of iron, we just see this as being maybe more nuanced than just a very, very peaceful time. There is going to be a struggle. There are going to be people who aren't going to want to submit to the rule of Christ. Especially at the beginning of the 1,000 years, Simon. It's going to take Christ's time to establish his government in Jerusalem, ruling from Mount Zion. And it's going to take time for the whole world to be evangelized and brought under subjection. Yeah, and it, and it, but then it, it and it seems like maybe once he thinks he's got once the world is under subjection, then Satan is released to, to test everybody. That's right. And uh, we're going to read about that now. So it is going to be very interesting. We will be enjoying no more tears. We will be in heaven, but on earth it's a transition period until the right. final beauty of the new heaven, new earth that will come at the end of the thousand years. And of course, uh, at the end of the thousand years, there won't be anyone left on earth who would remember how bad the world was before in the previous age of man's rule. So Satan's going to be able to tempt them and deceive them, kind of like he did Adam and Eve, that they're missing out on something that he, the devil, is able to give them if they rebel against God and follow him. I think I think you're right. I think you're right. Christ will restore the world. It's not the removal of the curse. The curse is still going to be there. That's not removed again. We'll read about it till the new heaven, new earth. So it's not going to be heaven on earth, but he certainly is going to make it a lot more like heaven on earth than it is now. But he's going to test the population of the world again at the end of the millennium by releasing Satan from prison. And should we read about that now? And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Doesn't sound like there's much of a battle this time, Simon. Before the battle can begin, God just fries them. Well, certainly they must have been, uh, I don't know, this army uh, has been gathering till they finally are able to surround God's people. Maybe a bit like something out of Lord of the Rings, you know, there's the, the God's people are surrounded God is allowing this. Jesus allows this to test, as he is now, he allows this evil to test people and test their hearts and test their choices. And then they are destroyed. And then finally we read in verse 10 of the destruction of Satan. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Wow. So finally, we have the end of Satan coming at the end of the 1,000-year period. Um, But this just opens our eyes that we believe that our series is the, you know, this, this series we're in. I like to compare it to a Netflix series. We're in a series now. It's the last day's series. And then we suddenly recognize that this isn't the final series. There is another series after it, which is the Millennium Series, which is a whole new ball game right and which concludes with this satanic rebellion against god once again and so that just gives us perspective i think sometimes we do get short-sighted and we think everything must happen to us now and then it's all finished Um, i liken it a bit to the pharisees who believed jesus was going to come back as a conquering king in their time you know that's right And, and that was no they were looking forward to this time in a way, and therefore they didn't recognize this poor carpenter. 
healing people and not really abiding by their sort of laws of righteousness. Right. That's why they were mistaken, because they, they mistook the prophecies that he would return as a king to throw off Roman rule. And he hadn't come to do that. He came to throw off the rule of sin. But anyway, now and only now do we have this great resurrection of everybody else who isn't saved, which we read about at the end of this chapter. Please listen carefully. It's, it's interesting. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Well, this is a remarkable passage. And I, I think it's a passage that all Christians should pay attention to. It shows that the dead will be raised to a judgment. I don't think anybody would want to be in this judgment. This is a judgment that you are going to be weighed in the balances and you will uh, may well end up in hell or in, in that lake of fire. However, what's clear to me is that they are not judged according to whether they've received Christ or not, because none of these people, especially those who in our time period did receive Christ and know Christ, otherwise they would have been saved. That's true. They are judged according to what they had done. It's repeated twice. And if you want to link to another passage, we go to that beautiful parable at the end of Matthew 25, where it says that Jesus judges all nations. Everybody is brought before him and they're going to be divided. Some are going to go to hell and some are going to go to life. And in that passage, again, the judgment isn't whether you've received me or not. The judgment is how did you treat my children? Wow. It's a judgment of love. Jesus is this final judgment is going to be a judgment of love. Yes. We see that not everybody who dies who hasn't received Jesus is going to be in the lake of fire. Because, of course, as we know, many people perhaps have not had the opportunity to hear the gospel presented to them and hear how to receive Christ, how to be born again. I don't want to stay on it too long, but I think it's really worth meditating on this passage that God's word says that this last judgment people will be judged according to their works. Yes. Um, and I think that's a bit of a shock to many people who say, no, if you don't receive Christ, you are going to hell and you're going to stay there forever and ever and ever. And then, of course, it gets on to the discussion about hell being maybe a waiting place. As it says here, hell is a waiting place. That's right. And then you come to the judgment. And then after this judgment even hell will be emptied. Hell itself is going to be put into the lake of fire. Wow. It's very interesting. And, and, but just interesting just to dwell on, meditate on the word here of what it says. But I, I quite like the simple verse that Jesus said in, in John 3. He said that he believes on the Son shall see life. He that believes not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So when we come to the judgment, it's the wrath of God abiding on you. That is the judgment. And you don't know which way it's going to go. And you may well be headed to the lake of fire because it's not in your hands. It's in God's hands judging you. And it's because of their own choice, Simon, because they could have received forgiveness no matter how bad they'd been. If they'd accepted the free gift of salvation by grace that Jesus paid for, and because they refused that gift, they now have to be judged according to their works. I don't know. I mean, I went to church the first 19 years of my life and nobody presented the gospel to me. How sad. You know, <laughs> so sometimes, even though the gospel is preached in all the world, uh, we know that the actual gospel sometimes isn't delivered into people's ways that they can receive it. So I think that's why there's a certain mercy here where many will be. Many are written in the book of life, but they just haven't, they haven't come to life, you know, yes. during their time on earth. But anyway, we want to move on now because we're just going to see that the next passage 
is finally the day we've been waiting for. This is when heaven is on earth. We read in Revelation 21 of a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. So this is when the, all the old heavens pass away and even the old earth passes away. That's that famous verse that Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away. And this is the time it passes away is at the end of the millennium when we're going to see a total recreation of the earth. It says there'll be no more sea. So then all the oceans will go. There's going to be much more space without the oceans and sea. That's right. And then we see this holy city, this God's dwelling place is no longer going to be separate to man, but God's dwelling place is coming down to the earth. Praise God. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband, and heard loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So this is the great, the great restoration of the world happens at the end of the thousand years. Yes. This is when the curse is removed. No more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. And he who sat on the throne said, I am making everything new. So the whole world is made new. And what is encouraging for us is that as Christians, we have been made new already. We are part of this kingdom, this perfect kingdom already, because it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. So already we are part of this, this wonderful God's kingdom. Wow. And so we just got to recognize, therefore, that the millennium is a, is a transitory stage. It's the, the rule of God comes down on earth, but not the dwelling of God. And the curse still seems to be active. There is still death. There is still crying. There is still pain. There is still sadness. The final fulfillment of the, the reconciliation of God with men comes at the end of the at the end of the millennium. Right. And the millennium itself is a transitionary right. period. Sometimes we're sort of it's rather short-sighted. You know, it's not taught in churches <laughs> properly at all. You know, we're not exposed to these scriptures in church and not many people get into it. But I think it's, it's very beautiful. It is. And very good. Shining bright in the dark night, you're listening to Nightlight. So it's just quite interesting now before we close. So we see this, there is this massive time period, the millennium. And I just wanted to read one more passage. It's from 2 Peter 3, uh, which describes the day of the Lord. And it brings us to quite an amazing conclusion, I think, about the day of the Lord. And so it's 2 Peter 3, 10 to 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wow. So what we notice there is Paul describes the day of the Lord coming, and then he describes this event at the end of the millennium, this dissolving of the earth. And the melting of everything, the heavens and the earth are all going to be melted and remade and dissolved. And he describes that as the day of the Lord. Right. And so, interestingly enough, we come to this conclusion that this day of the Lord is not actually a 24-hour day. That the day of the Lord is actually the descript, God's description for this a thousand year period. Because Paul, Peter says, the day of the Lord is going to include the melting and dissolving of the heavens and earth in preparation for the new heavens and new earth. And then we have the wonderful verse 8, 
of course, which sort of in the same chapter, which tells us this in a way. It says, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And I think it's just quite a beautiful uh, revelation for all of us, God's children here, that this day of the Lord is actually in a thousand year period. Um, if you go through the genealogies of the Bible, the, if you go through it exactly by the years, it describes an earth that is 6,000 years old. That's right. We've had, coming up to 2030, we'll have about 2,000 years of that being the church age since Christ was crucified. It appears that if Christ returns soon, as, as many believe he will, because of the rise of evil, the rise of the Antichrist, the implementation of the mark of the beast, the fourth industrial revolution, which will change people physically and biologically, that when Christ returns soon, then that will initiate a final thousand year period of world history, making a 7,000 year period of history of the world before the new heavens, new earth. And many people see this matching the seven days of creation, that this 7,000 year period is, is sort of prophesied by the seven days of creation, and that the seventh day when God rested will be this millennial period, which will be a period of rest on the earth, because there won't be war. There will still be problems and, and wickedness and difficulties that we're going to have to rule over, but there certainly won't be war. So it will be a time of of peace. And many people are recognizing that the theory of evolution is a fabrication purely in an effort to blind people to the actual reality of a creator and that in reality we are living on a young earth and that this uh, millennium, this day of the Lord is actually going to be this final thousand year period. And so I, I think Second Peter 3 is real powerful evidence of that because he says in the day of the Lord, everything's going to get melted and, and, and destroyed in preparation for the new heavens and new earth. And so therefore, this day of the Lord's wrath is not just one day. It is indicating that the Lord is coming back to rule. He's not going to take any nonsense. He's not going to say this is a time of free will and free choice. You can decide what you want. This is when also free will is going to be restricted. And there's going to be a rule over the earth to ensure righteousness, to ensure peace, to ensure godliness, to ensure all the, um, the sin, especially that is just erupting in the world now, will be policed and will be restricted and will be punished during these thousand years. For me as a Christian and looking at God's word, that recognition that the coming of Jesus is not the final event, but that there is another larger, longer period, this a thousand year period of Christ's rule afterwards, I think it's very enlightening. What is clear is that the day of the Lord's wrath takes place after the tribulation. And that's probably the most important point of this talk, is that the sixth seal says the day of the wrath of the Lamb has come. And that happens at the sixth seal after the tribulation and not before. And the church needs to prepare for going through this tribulation period. The Bible says that judgment starts at the house of God, and God's people are going to be tested and are going to go through the ringer during this uh, wicked period, this tribulation period. But that is right. That is how God does it. Yes. God's children go through this testing first, and then before his wrath falls and his judgment falls on the the people of the earth and the Antichrist. That's right. But there we go. That's my conclusion. Because I, it's not easy for Christians when there's not a clear sound of the trumpet. You know, there's not a clear teaching for Christians. There's multitudes of teaching on the last days. And so many of them, especially in America, are leaning towards a, a pre-trib rapture. Don't worry, Jesus is going to come at any time. And you don't have to worry about the future. You don't have to prepare because you're going to be taken out before the time of tribulation. So sad. I think that does the church a great disservice because yeah. we do need to prepare for these times in, in any way possible. But there we go. That's the, that's 
just looking at the span of Revelation. And so an, another picture I quite like is that of a tent. Book of Matthew 24 and the books of Daniel, they, they're a tent which spans from the time they were given to Christ's return. And that's the tent. But Revelation, the book of Revelation, also covers the period of Christ's return, but then also covers this next 1,000-year period. So it's like a fly sheet that pulls over the tent and then covers this next 1,000-year period. And it deserves, uh, that deserves recognition. And when you try to put all of Revelation onto our period, then you, you make a mistake. There is going to be an extra thousand year period afterwards. Fortunately, we're going to be in heaven for that. We're going to be living, ruling with Jesus and ruling with him. The tears will be wiped from our eyes at his return. But for the inhabitants of the earth, there's going to be another transitory period before the new heaven and new earth. And I think it's just very important to recognize that. And thank you so much, Simon Bennett. And Simon is author of the Let's Look Forward trilogy of books on last day's scripture, which I highly recommend. And you'll find the link to where you can buy them on Amazon below. This is Chris Glynn signing out and looking forward to being back with you again soon for another Nightlight podcast. God bless.